Hello, and welcome back to The Loop Talking Tech. I'm Ben Bilson, Head of Technology Sector RSM, and today I'm rejoined by RSM UK economist Tom Pugh. In our first episode together, we explored the massive impact AI can have on society and the economy. But since then, something huge happened. In January, DeepSeek released its latest model, DeepSeek r -on. This claimed to rival the tech used in leading model ChatGPT, but at a fraction of the cost. The popularity of this app rattled investors. It wiped billions off the market value of US tech stocks and called into question whether US-based leading firms would continue to dominate and drive the emerging trends in AI. So me and Tom are back. But before you begin, if you missed our first episode, now's the perfect time to hit pause and catch up. Trust me, you won't want to miss it. And now you're back, let's dive in. So now, Tom, you requested we do this special episode. Why was that? Yeah, I mean, because as you just said in the intro, um, a little while after we did our first one, we had this announcement about DeepSeek. And I think there's some really interesting implications for financial markets, for stock prices across the board, but more importantly, for the way that AI will influence the rest of the economy and the speed that that will happen. Yeah. So we recorded and then almost within a week, yeah. Deep Seek happened. So um, we were made functionally redundant almost instantly, yeah. which is quite funny actually in retrospect. But it's probably worth just talking about what Deep Seek is, um, which I'll try and summarize. But broadly, um, Deep Seek is a large language model, chat assistant, um, feels and looks very similar to chat GPT. Um, the thing that's really interesting about this app was it was developed um, reportedly for, I think, $5 million. This was developed actually in China out of a hedge fund. And then it was also developed using older um, chips. They released um, a technical statement, a press report in it. And actually, subsequent to that, people have looked into it and said, you know, $5 million feels like a low number. And I think there is a general acceptance that that's not the true cost of developing the app. Yeah, I, I, there's a, one of the fascinating things I find about this is that it wasn't developed by you know a, a big tech firm. It was essentially some quants at a hedge fund in their spare time yeah. have managed to do this. And I think you're completely right. You know, there's a question over whether you take that five million pounds at at, at face value. You know, whether it should be a lot more. There's a whole bunch of you know, theories around you know, the exact cost and how it works and all that kind of thing. But I think in general, you know, this is how technology is supposed to work. Mm. Somebody comes up with a, with a new technology. At first, it's incredibly expensive to do. It requires state of the art technology it requires a huge amount of investment and then other people come along and they look at that and they either innovate on that technology to make it better or they find ways of doing the same or same thing or similar things for a lot cheaper that is exactly how it's supposed to work that's how technology has always worked throughout the history of you know, civilization so it's not a huge surprise that okay even if we don't take that you know the, the five million pounds or whatever at, at face value it's not a huge surprise that actually something like this would have happened. Yeah, like whether we accept the five million is a really tight definition of yeah. direct cost because it's within a hedge fund. There are other people, other R&D costs. Like broadly accepting, it's a smaller amount than the amount that's being used in the United States. And yeah. we talked in episode one about how you need enormously deep pockets to be at the cutting hedge of AI. And I think the reason that the market, well, let's talk about the market in a minute, but the reason lots of people reacted with surprise was how on earth has this comparable, better model been developed using a fraction of resources? You know, how they've done this. Um, and you're touching there on something I'm comfortable with in tech, the idea of trickle-down technology. Um, I would cut to use the example of Formula One, where ABS brakes were developed with an F1. They're enormously expensive on the early cars, but over time that technology cascades its way down into all our vehicles at the fraction of a cost. So I'd be interested to know what your, just expand on that, Tom, from an economic perspective, when you have tech innovations that are enormously expensive trickle down, if that's the case, why was there such a profound market reaction to DeepSeek? I guess the scale of the improvement. You know, we're not talking about they've managed to do it for 
10% cheaper or 15% cheaper. You know, this is orders of magnitude cheaper than, than previous models. So I think that's a big shock. The other reason financial markets reacted very strongly, I think, is, you know, you can kind of view NVIDIA, for example, as having a bit of a monopoly mm-hmm. on this kind of thing. Um, and that demand, you know, we've seen the almost insatiable demand for those cutting edge chips propel NVIDIA stocks and its earnings, importantly, higher and higher each quarter. This kind of, I guess, pulls the rug out from those assumptions that In order to develop the latest and greatest AI, you need the most cutting edge chips. If that's not the case, if you can do it with, you know, that's, I guess, the second generation down chips or whatever it is, then actually that that pulls or removes a bit of that kind of NVIDIA monopoly type thing. That's a threat to kind of their earnings or that earnings model, at least. I mean, let's pause on NVIDIA. You're right. They used an older form of nvidia chip which was available in china and they could get it and they couldn't get the latest ones um and that's nvidia so what we're saying is a business that makes all the cutting edge chips is pre-sold into the future you know you have to pay to get ahead of supply chain to get them kind of rocks that to the foundation i suppose it wasn't just nvidia though that saw a you know stock value impacted it was all big us tech stocks were impacted consequently and is that just a function of perhaps a misunderstanding of whether we need to be the biggest tech company to world develop ai was it too much enthusiasm is it kind of misunderstood innovation premium what do we think yeah i mean well there's there's a couple of things going on you've got that kind of nvidia acting as a bellwether for the entire tech sector that's kind of one thing so if nvidia goes down all the other tech stocks follow it just because that's seen as the bellwether so you'll have all sorts of algorithmic trading models that that reinforce those kind of trends so that's one thing i think there is another issue that if it takes billions of dollars to effectively create these ai models then the only companies that can afford to do that are your kind of your magnificent seven your facebook's your amazons your, your whoever else they would then be expected to capture all of the upside in premium from this If it turns out that's not the case, then actually you have to discount those future earnings by more, probably. Uh, And then the third, I think, factor is you've got an awful lot going on outside of the tech sector. You know, at the same time, we've got Donald Trump coming in. We've got all sorts of noise around tariffs. We've got potential uh, inflation coming back up in the US, and that means interest rates might stay higher than they otherwise would have done. We know that tech stocks are particularly vulnerable to increases in interest rates. So there's kind of a broader market trend, and we've seen the US market enter correction territory now, which means it's down 10% from its kind of peaks. So that's going on in the background, not specifically related to deep seek or anything like that, but it sets sets the tone for everything. And then you've got these kind of essentially deep seek challenging a lot of the assumptions that these ultra high valuations are based on yeah i mean is it like straw breaking camel's back do you think or do you think do you think um one thing i think about as i look at it is is it just the scale is it that five million or 50 million versus yeah 800 billion i think it's partly the scale and it's partly that a lot of these stocks were essentially priced to the max price that you know everything has to go exactly to plan you know you see it every time nvidia releases earnings if they don't quite be you know if revenue growth is only 50 percent rather than 60 percent, or you know just picking numbers out then the stock will come off because the expectations for these stocks are so high that anything that kind of undermines that or highlights the vulnerability will lead to will lead to stocks coming down. And we talked about it in January. We talked about the US's head start in this area. And then something like Deep Seek happens in China, albeit in a hedge fund as a potentially even a side project. Um, what does that mean to us in the United Kingdom? Does it mean that actually um we can do the same thing? Can we 
catch up really quickly in your view? Or do you think actually we need to just look at this in isolation and say it's still the same playing field um, we expected before? No, I think I think if you take the deep sea at its face value, and this is a genuine change in the way that these things can be developed, then there are loads of UK companies that can afford the, you know, if you're talking about a few millions, tens of millions, that really does open the playing field to who can start developing these kind of models. Mm. I think that's that's the first thing, that it really does change it from a, you have to have a balance sheet in the billions, tens of billions to be able to, to fund this kind of development to you know, most large upper medium sized companies could start to look at that kind of investment. I do think that is a is a real change shift in I guess the the environment that we're operating in. Yeah. It does make you wonder with the right encouragement, whether it's like policy, funding, exploring an open source route and thinking about, you know, what opportunities exist when you actually work within open source as opposed to kind of closing the code. It does make you wonder if um there's a place for other countries to participate in this enormous economic upside. But um you're still going to be pretty lucky and have deep pockets, haven't you? That's one of the challenges here. We're yet to see somebody develop something comparable based on their desktop computer in a garage, aren't we? I think yeah. you're still talking about something where you need expertise, intelligence, time, luck. Yeah. Um, there's so much at play, isn't it? You still need to have a pretty sizable balance sheet to be able to, even if we're talking the tens of millions, you know, 99% of firms in the UK employ something like less than 25 people they're very unlikely to be able to you know, invest, do that kind of investment. So you're still talking the kind of upper 1% of firms in the UK. But that is a genuine shift from what, potentially what we were talking about before, where instead of tens of millions, you needed billions. You know, so you, it is dramatically opening the playing field, I think. And I think it will probably just be a matter of time before you see more and more of these kind of innovations. We talked about how over time the benefits of the advancement technology help the economy, yet the efficiency gains, faster innovation, faster products, and that transforms the way we work and live. But in your view, does deep seek represent an acceleration of that time frame? Or is it actually something where you say, no, this is actually planned to happen and ignoring the market reaction, nothing here has really changed what we talked about in January. It's just the latest development. Yeah, I I think in terms of the ultimate aim or the, or the ultimate impact in terms of you know ai improving productivity etc cetera, etc cetera, i think that probably doesn't change massively mm. i think the time scale does change because the time that it takes to implement these ai models to test them to innovate with them to see what works to see what doesn't work if you can do that for you know in the millions rather than the billions i think you will see an exponential increase in the number of firms doing this and that will dramatically shorten that time period to where we find okay it works great for this or we've developed specific applications for this xyz doesn't work so great for, for all of this kind of stuff over here and that will accelerate the time for when we see those real impacts in the real economy and that is what drives economic growth not the kind of movements in financial markets i mean that's one of the things that's interesting here about the open source element of this that if all the technology is hidden in the black box no one understands it that means that in some ways if you own and understand that black box you capture the wealth mm -hmm. if the world moves towards the great use of open source everyone understands the code um everyone can in theory play with it access it and you could get faster innovation and disruption it's a bit like only one person can invent the first printing press one turned up and saw it and then you start seeing the copies and then you yeah. start seeing more books and you see that massive innovation it's the same thing isn't it it's yeah. the same general trend taking place yeah. um but if you're like a business leader today and you're sat there looking at <clears throat> what happened with deep seek thinking about artificial intelligence does it change your playbook in your view, Tom, or does it just remind us that we need to have AI on the agenda and we need to keep reacting to it as it moves through? Yeah, I, it's a really good point. I'm not, I'm not convinced that it changes the playbook immediately because I think there's still quite a few questions about 
deep seek i think there's a whole bunch of things about you've got to work out how you would replicate that methodology etc etc so i'm not convinced you're going to see loads of firms going out tomorrow and, and trying to replicate this but like like you said before i think given maybe a, a couple of years you will start to see this kind of thing before and perhaps previously we might have been talking about you know, well into this kind of 2030s before you actually saw any impact and do we get anywhere on government policy because we you know we we're not part of the european union so we're not necessarily bound by their regulation here it's a relatively new government um there's still a chance for them to do things does it change their view in your view is there anything they can they should be focused on well i mean you look at uh, starmer's speech mm. the uh, the other week and it's littered with references to ai mm. technology this is clearly at the forefront of, of government's mind mm. to kind of put it into context one of the reasons the uk economy has done so terribly since the financial crisis is because our productivity growth has been really poor i think that's quite well publicized one of the key reasons our productivity growth has been so poor is because productivity in the public sector has been quite significantly negative so that's been a real drag on the overall economy one of the ways the government wants to deal with this is by using ai and I, you know, ai in its broadest kind of catch-all term to go into government and see what they could do more efficiently where you could replace people for tech how tech can you know increase productivity within the public sector because that's kind of one of the only areas where government has direct control they can't force businesses to go out and invest in ai no, but they can create policies that attract the right people to the yeah, UK. Yeah, absolutely. They can create a sense of excellence. They can procure chips and build supercomputers. They can create clusters um, around universities and labs and businesses. And they can provide tax incentives that encourage research and development in these areas. So they've got lots and lots of levers they can yeah. pull. Um, but I guess what you're saying is actually in terms of direct policy, where they probably will start is focusing on the public sector and how they apply these tools to find productivity like, gains. Yeah, I think it's one of the one of the areas that they have really identified and focused on. Now, we've heard this kind of stuff before. You know, every government talks about increasing the efficiency of public services, increasing the productivity. I think you know, so take it all with a pinch of salt, and we all know the history of big government it projects they don't typically work out very well so again there are plenty of reasons i think to be skeptical but we've seen such significant decreases in in public sector productivity that i think it's getting to a bit of a crisis point now we know the fiscal situation is is very stretched you can't simply just throw more money at the problem that's one of the things so you've got to work out how you can do more with less or the same amount basically so i think that's one of those areas but they won't be able to do it alone if they don't do any of the things that you just talked about in terms of you know, incentivizing the private sector to develop all of this kind of stuff then you're not going to be able to effectively apply it to the public sector yeah i, I just think you you cannot have one without the other and i'm not quite sure they've fully realized that yet and it's worth noting too that we expect in the spring to see more detail more announcements around policy especially around um science and tech innovation that's been promised so it's a real case of watching this space mm -hmm. and you know i think that's a good time to draw it to line here to say thank you um just to everyone listening thank you for your time and joining us do subscribe today to step state with the loop talking tech and in the meantime you can find out more from our website which is linked in the show notes thank you very much for listening